Well, let me start by saying that uh, this is uh, a meeting called Rabbi and Friends uh, from Beth Yeshua there. Uh, so uh, that's how we get together on this. And uh, it, I was so blessed to, to be able to do this, you know, this uh, parasha uh, on top of our normal lesson. Uh, how many of you get to read the parasha? No? Sheila? Well, we do on Saturdays, you know. Yeah. So were you, were you looking at Numbers 22? Yes. Oh, good. Because to me, this story is a wonderful story. And I was really blessed to go back and uh, readdress it. If you guys have your Bibles and you want to open to Numbers 22, go ahead. And then uh, I, I, I just think it's worthy of spending a few minutes in reading this. And then before we go into our, our normal study in Thessalonians. Numbers 22, uh, this is the story where God allows a donkey to speak. What a wonderful story. I mean, you know, I look at animals' faces and often I can tell what they're thinking and what they want to say, you know. I mean, they jump up and down, I want to go outside and whatever. But God allows this donkey to speak. And uh, so I... Hi, Mona. Hi, Mona. <laughs> uh, so does everybody have Numbers 22 or some of you have 22 open? Yes. So here's the story now. I'm going to give you a little overview and then we'll go into it. Balak sends Balaam to curse the Jews, okay? And his talking, talking donkey tries to stop him to no avail. Each time he opens his mouth, Balaam ends up blessing the nation instead. And uh, so I'd like you to look at, let's start in, uh, in verse, uh, I think it's six, six through, is that six? Mm -hmm. I want to start at the top. Five. Five through, um, five. oh. Five. Okay, start in five. Sheila, if you would, would you read that five through, I think, ten? Sure. Okay. Or six. No, well, five and six. Five sorry, and six. What, what book of the Bible are you in? I was... Um, numbers. 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 Oh. Numbers. Yeah. Wait, one read, second. Read numbers. verses five and six. 128. Um, I, I was in the wrong book. Okay. Now, listen, these just to uh, preface this, these are non-Jews. They're Moabites and uh, people from other countries. And one of the leaders is asking this Balaam to go and curse the Jews because he's a prophet. And then that he says, uh, your cursing will curse them. Uh, for one thing, what I was reminded of was when we pray and people say, thank you for your prayers, I often think, no, Thank God for his answers. You know, the prayers are great, and I love praying for people, but, you know, we give credit where credit is due. So, anyways, go ahead if you would, Sheila. Okay, so Numbers 22, and what? You could five? start right at the top at number one and read all the way down to number okay. three. Okay, number two. Okay, to number two. Okay, so um, the uh, donkey rebukes Balaam. Then Bnei Israel set out and camped in the plan, plains of Moab alongside the Jordan across from Jericho, Parashat Balak. When Balak, son of Zippor, realized all that Bnei Israel had done to the Amorites, Moab became terrified because there were so many people. Moab was filled with dread because of Bnei Israel. Moab said to the elders of Midian, the multitude will lick up everything around us. The ox licks up the grass of the field. Now Balak, son of Zippor, was king of Moab at that time. He sent messengers to summon Balaam, uh, Balaam, son of Beor, at Petor, near the river in his native land, saying to him, look now, a people has come out of Egypt. So see now, they cover the surface of the earth and are settling beside me. Come now, curse this people for me, because they are too strong for me. Perhaps I may be able to defeat them and drive them away from the country. I know that whoever you bless will be blessed and whoever you curse will be accursed. So let's stop there for a second. Um, 
I, who do you see that's not involved in what they're trying to bring about against the Israelites? Yeah, you're, you're muted, but that's who it is. I can see what you're saying, Diane. Uh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So he's what this guy is saying to Balaam is, you know, what whoever you curse is going to be cursed, and whoever you don't curse is not going to be cursed. And but they leave out God, and I don't know. To me, it's very interesting because God steps in and and He intervenes for the Jewish people in this story. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. Um, if we go down to. Uh, would somebody like to read verse 12? Anybody have it? Go ahead, Kalita. God said to Balaam, wait a minute, I know Carol wasn't needed. God said to Balaam, do not go with them. Do not curse them, for they are blessed. <laughs> so uh, now, you know, this guy that told Balaam to go is a king, and, and Balaam it wants to listen to him, right? But God has told them. So um, take a look now. I'm just pretty interesting. I hope you enjoy this story. Look down to verse 20. Verse 20. Would, uh, Mona, you got your Bible there? You want to read verse 20? Uh, 2220, is that what we're saying? Numbers 2220. All right, hold on. Give me a sec. Uh, 22, hold on, I just got to get my eyes on. Uh, God came to Balaam during the night and said to him, if the men have come to summon you, get up and go with them, but do only what I tell you. So what do you think about this story so far? I mean, Balaam's kind of in the hot seat here, you know? And, and uh, I think often, you know, we may find ourselves kind of in a hot seat as well. You know, he's probably fearful and uh, a lot of what's going on around the world and in the news might want to make us a little more fearful. But God has told them, get up and go with these guys, not agree with them. But go with them. So uh, let's take let's pick up in verse uh, 26. Someone have that? Right here. Lystra? Verse 26. Yeah, Rebecca, hello. We're, we're in Numbers 22, verse 26. It's the uh, parasha for today. Okay. The angel again moved. He stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, right or left. And then 27. When the donkey saw the angel of Adonai, she lay down under Balaam. Balaam was very angry and beat the donkey with his staff. Hold on one second. This is the third time that the donkey has rejected going forward. Okay. I didn't want to read all three, but I wanted to read, let you know. He did different things to stop, but this time he laid down and he stopped. Go ahead, Lystra. Okay. I'm up to 28. Then Adonai opened the donkey's mouth and she said to Balaam, and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have beaten me these three times? Balaam said to the donkey, Because you've made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey which you have ridden as, as always to this day? Have I ever been in the habit of doing this to you? No, she said. Then Adonai opened Balaam's eye, and he saw the angel of Adonai standing in the road with his drawn sword in his hand. So he fell on his face. The angel of Adonai said to him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? Behold, I came as an adversary because your way before me is a reckless one. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If she had not turned away from me by now, I would have killed you indeed, but let her live. Balaam said to the angel of Adonai, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in the way in the road to oppose me. Now, if this is displeasing in your eyes, I will go back home. The angel of Adonai said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only the word that I will tell you. So Balaam went with Balak's princes. 
When Balak heard that Balaam had come, he went out to greet him at the Moabite city on the border of the Anon, the frontier of the territory. Balaam said to, Balak said to Balaam, Didn't I send you an urgent summons? Why didn't you come to me? Am I unable to reward you? Look, I have come to you now, Balaam said to Balak. Can I just say anything? I must speak only the message which God puts into my mouth. Then Balaam went with Balak to Kiriath Husoth. Balak sacrificed cattle and sheep and sent some to Balaam and the princes who were with him. In the morning, Balak took Balaam with him to Bemoth Baal, and from there he saw part of the people. Okay, so, uh, interesting story. Now, where is Balaam going to go now? What do you think is going to happen? I mean, is he going to go with this angel? Uh, he's yeah, God to, told him to go. He, yeah, that's right. And he's been asked to curse uh, the Israelites. Mm -hmm. and, and that then they would be cursed. But God, those wonderful, wonderful words, but God. <laughs> because uh, I'm going to read a synopsis of, of what happens here. This man hires Balaam, a non-Jewish prophet, to curse the Jews, and Balaam saddles his donkey and sets out on the journey. God sends an angel to block his path, and Balaam's donkey, seeing the angel, goes off the road to bypass the angel. Balaam, who doesn't see the angel, beats the donkey for getting off the road. The donkey then opens its mouth and starts speaking to Balaam, asking why is he beating him. Then Balaam sees the angel and tells him that he should know that he will not be able to curse the Jews and will only be able to say what God allows him to. So Balaam arrives in his destination and King Balaam and all these dignitaries are there. They're waiting for Balaam to come and curse the Jews. Balaam, <laughs> Balaam begins... Uh, Instead of, cursing, instead of cursing them, Balaam begins to speak, and instead of cursing the Jews, he blesses them. Hey, Mona. Mona, your speaker is on. Oh, sorry, you can hear me? Yeah. I'm talking to the dogs. They're oh, yeah. all right. They're, so they're, me... they're antsy. I'm the only one here, and I'm dog sitting and they're just antsy um, so. we're going to do that next week for the sorry whole but i'll put you on mute sorry all right so oh, balak, dogs balak, who is the king okay. he tells balaam what did you do i hired you to curse the jews and instead of your blessing them and balaam replied that he can only say what words god puts in his mouth and balak balak takes balaam to another mountain hoping that he can change the place and allow him to be more successful in cursing the Jews. But when Balaam opens his mouth again, he says more blessings. And this time, Balak just says, enough. Don't curse them and don't bless them. Just don't say anything. But Balak really wants it to work. So they go to one last place. And there, once again, Balaam opens his mouth and out come blessings. Finally, Balak gets really angry. He says, I hired you to curse my enemies, and instead you're blessing them three times. Balak, Balaam answers that he can only say the words that God puts in his mouth, and then ends with a prophecy about the, t uh, the time of the Messiah. Unfortunately, the Jews then began to sin, serving other idols, and so on. So uh, that... I don't know. It, to me, it's a wonderful story. Does anybody have anything that they would uh, pick up through those words? Any any encouragement or guidance? I find it interesting that when you say no to God, for instance, Moses <clears throat> kind of said no to God, but God had a plan even beyond that. that I, I will accommodate you. I'm going to get my work done one way or the other. And that's kind of what happened here. Um, yeah. They yeah. Wanted, uh, wanted that higher. 
mm. you know, doing God's will in a roundabout way. So let's go to today's life. Do we see obstacles for living a righteous life right in our path? Shoot every moment. I have four dogs here. There, there have been an obstacle this morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can be a blessing. I don't think they're going to talk to you, but they're going to tell you when they got to do certain they, things. They might. <laughs> Shoot, they'll tell me. They'll tell me when I when they don't like me. You know, th these are these are needy kind of. They're kind of needy dogs. They're sweet dogs, but they can be very needy. And <laughs> you know, and they'll. And they don't like it when they don't get what they want, you know. And I—that's for sure. Right, you know. That um, is I was true. thinking. I was thinking that when you started asking the question, um, um, in terms of you know, you know, what does God think about what's going on among the body today and among the leaders today? And I think you know, and and people don't. We know, like we know. I know we know, but in general, those who are committing evil they think that they're you know they're right with god they're you know whether they're could call themselves believers or not and i think there, you know there will be a day of reckoning scripture says so you know there'll be times of reckoning and um that'll be interesting to see well you know it's funny because you just mentioned exactly what we're going to look at in thessalonians oh, there we go. that's exactly what the study is uh you know because the Thessalonians, they, they, uh, people were trying to misguide them in a big, big, big way. And they were religious leaders that were doing it. You know, this Balak wasn't a religious, well, he wasn't a Jewish guy. He was religious in his own religion and had his own path. And the same with even Balaam. What it reminds me often uh, is what you guys have said, but also Proverbs said, you know, man, uh, takes his steps or, or uh, makes his plans and God directs his steps. He has his way. Uh, you know, I, I think we all see it often. It's a wonderful thing about what separates what Mona just said. If we are children of God, believe me, we have the good shepherd, the great magnificent shepherd to make sure that his plans will be carried out oh. ultimately sorry re, re, chuck you got froze it's funny when you make we're making your point your screen froze so can you repeat what you were saying yeah that we have this great shepherd who is our good shepherd jesus said it and he's never going to stop being our good shepherd so even if we want to stray or have a tendency to stray in the end He's going to guide us to that purpose and plan that he has for our life. Sometimes we may miss out on some things because we strayed away during that particular moment. But usually God is not going to take us off the path and remove us from the purpose. He's going to put us back on the path. That's what he did with this Balaam guy. You know, Balaam could have just said, hey, I'm sorry. God isn't going to let me re uh, condemn these Jews. And uh, so... Uh, I'm not going to try to bring a curse on them. So you might as well just send me home. But he didn't say that. He three times he let the man see, I want to curse them, but God is not allowing me to curse them. Kind of like having that good shepherd, but in an extreme way, you know. Uh, even like you, you have five dogs. He had one donkey. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> those dogs are going to kind of control your day a little bit, you know. They're going to try. <laughs> Can you put this away? Anyway, okay, so anyone have anything else they want to bring up about that wonderful story? Uh, when we were studying this yesterday at Temple, uh, Rabbi Adrian was uh, doing it, uh, and uh, he was saying, we're talking about the animals, and he was saying he thinks that that at one time the animals were communicating with the people. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And that it reminds me, Listen, it's just an off the subject subject. Are animals going to be in heaven? Well, I I have to believe. You can check if you're talking. I don't I don't know if it's hold on. I don't know if it's it, everybody else or are you getting seeing screens freeze or is it just my connection? You just froze up for a second, so I don't know what's happening. I can see me, I, like when I talk, I'm not. 
Are all of you Frozen, seeing things freeze? You guys are glitchy. Diane, are you seeing things freeze? No, okay. Okay. I, I saw a, a Mona freeze ago. just now when she was talking. But... Yeah, I think it was on your side, Mona. Uh, I haven't seen it. Yeah, you froze right. up right now. Okay. okay. So, all right, let's go back to the pair shop. Sheila? Yes. Do you have more that you would like to share? No, that was it. Okay. But, but I mean, also, obviously, there is something. Um, so we went on to talking about that more about the animals. And uh, he was saying, the rabbi, that when you have an animal, a pet, and you look into their eyes and you can see your emotions, you can, there is a connection there. Even if, so nowadays, we may not talk the talk that we do, but you can connect with them, definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, that is so true. Uh, you know, maybe it's something that uh, we miss out on that we could take advantage of. You know, I believe in looking at the creation. I love the clouds and the trees and the birds and even the people. Uh, God's creation is so uh, encouraging and comforting uh, so often. And it's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But when you look into the eyes of the animals and you see their heart uh, coming out, I don't know, to me, they usually, <laughs> usually, are showing such an uh, unconditional love and a desire to just, you know, be a comfort. You know, that's usually Absolutely. what they want. Of course, they want comforting, and Mona has five dogs, so there's a lot of effort, but, you know, just uh, get a petting machine. Maybe. Oh, there, there you go, yeah. <laughs> and then my dog I have is an emotional support dog. So, um, as I said, my son passed away, it's nine years, and a year after he passed, I got the dog. I hadn't had dogs before. Let me tell you, he fills that hole. He's just amazing. The dog really, I think God, I know God really designed the dog. He designs everybody's dog for the people. He definitely does, Scooby does. They are a gift from God, there's no doubt about it. Definitely. You know, we don't have one right now. We've had most of our lives had dogs. Uh, but we, next week we have one for a whole week who we love his little his name is Zephaniah is Zephaniah 317 that's, that's the card that his owner gives away but he's going to come and spend the week and he's deaf I mean really deaf mm -hmm. and yeah, his eyes are bad too but he's the cutest little dog anyway so we love having him come and stay with us maybe you'll see him next Sunday is he here next Sunday no. oh he won't be here okay all right, so let's turn to uh, Second Thessalonians. Uh, there's a few verses that I would like people to read, but most of them are there, except for the memory verse, which is Matthew 24, 42. Uh, if anybody would go to Matthew 24, 42, which one of you would like to read that? Lystra? I don't have it, one minute. Okay, somebody get 24, 42, Matthew 24, 42. As soon as you have it, it's one of you have it just go ahead. I'll learn the parable here. from the fig tree. When its branches become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Okay. Is that it? Matthew 24, 42. 32. 42. 42. 42. 42. Yeah. Therefore, stay alert, for you do not know what day your lord is coming i'll tell you those two verses you just read are very similar in their meaning but the second one tells you stay alert the first one tells you how you can stay alert you know when the fig tree does this that fruit is coming and it's the same with our lives and then what you read would you reread matthew 24 42 therefore stay alert for you do not know what day your lord is coming that's right so Stay alert. And that's what we're, we're looking at today, observing. And, and the accident that uh, you might think is just a, a coincidence that you read 32 is no coincidence because really 42 defines 32 in a wonderful way. Uh, you know, uh, we do know a lot of things that are going to happen and we can tell a lot of things. You know, I have, I have little tomato plants out in my front yard. They're cherry tomatoes, right? Uh, and when they produce a flower, what do you think comes next? The fruit. That's right. The fruit. 
It's automatic. I all I have to see the flowers and I know there's tomatoes coming. There are not many. We've only eaten three so far. But they are coming, you know. So we can observe things from nature and we can uh, also observe things in life. But he says what he says in 42, just always be ready. This uh, this study reminded me uh, to remind you of, I didn't, did you ever see anybody doing that shell game where they have three shells and they try to confuse you, you know? So when they do that, if they, if they try to distract you, how, how can they distract you from watching so that you're not so observant? What could they use? Well, they should start talking to you. Yeah. Yeah, they could just start talking to you. All you have to do is not give them a split second. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's what Paul is talking about here. If you guys have that first paragraph, in my book, it's called First Thoughts, but I know it, in yours, it's just the first paragraph. It starts with the object of the shell game. Somebody has that. Would you go ahead and read it? The object of the shell game is for one person to keep his eyes on the shell that is that has a ball in it, while another person moves the three shells around. The key to winning is staying focused on the shell with the ball while shutting out the distraction, distracting chatter of the person moving the shells. We count, encounter lots of chatter in our world about the end of time that can distract us and cause us to lose focus. Paul warned the church at Thessalonica to observe and stay focused on what they knew to be true. Okay. Um, that's really the crux of our uh, study. And the question that it brings up, two questions. What kind of chatter might distract the person, like we already, I already asked you, when you're playing the shell game? And you said conversation. What is there anything else that could distract you from that shell game? The dogs. <laughs> the dogs? Definitely. Yeah. Movement, right. movement yeah. and and sound around you. There's many means. You know, I would <laughs> I'll tell you a story. When I was a kid, I was about 16 and I got my driver's license. And I went over to my aunt's house with some of my cousins and nobody was home. So I took it upon myself to grab my aunt's keys and take her car for a ride. <coughs> he wasn't home. So I thought, oh, I'm just going to drive the car. Well, I drove around by my high school, which is a couple minutes away from the house. And this thing fell off the mirror or the dashboard and <laughs> fell on my lap. When that happened, I'm a 16 year old brand new driver. I let go of the wheel and reached down to grab this thing, which I didn't even know what it was. And the car goes over the curb onto a lawn. <laughs> By God's grace, who I did not know at that time, I didn't hit anything. My heart was pounding out of my chest. And we got we got the car back to my aunt's house, parked it, and thanked whatever there was, which was God, that we didn't do any damage. And to this day, no one in my family even knows that happened. <laughs> You have my permission to tell them now. Anyway, anything, a lot of things can distract us. But the other thing is now looking at this world, how does how does looking at a shell game and that chatter compare with the chatter that causes us, people who are seeking to know God and be, live as well, to lose our the focus in our spiritual life? How does it happen? Go ahead, Mona. You know, it, it really, you know, it doesn't take much at all. It could just be a simple thought. You know, like you had that thought about the car keys, right? You know, the car. I'm taking the car. It doesn't even have to be some sort of outside influence of what's even going on in the world. It could just be our own thought that we have about something. You know, and it's just so, you know, just as you you know, as we're going through this lesson, you know, when you ask the question, like, you know, we can lose sight of the Lord so quick. <coughs> 
it, it takes very, like, very, very, very little. <coughs> like, you know, you know, we have to have faith of a mustard seed to believe it only takes that little <coughs> bit of thought to get distracted or from what we need to, you know, what we should be up to or not up to. It's just. Yeah. It's so true. <coughs> I'll tell you something that I learned while we were on foreign mission, while we were away from the country. I was I was asked to take part in many, 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 many countless Christian works everywhere. Countless. And what I learned was Satan can also, and it's not part of this study, but I think it's worth interjecting here. Satan can also use good things that might distract you from the best things. Thing is, you know, he says you have not said you ask not, and Balaam asked of God, and he wound up getting the answer. And here in Thessalonica, what we're going to read is you're going to see Paul giving them some good direction about misguidance, and the misguidance was religious guidance. But what I found in a recent study with these guys in recovery, one girl brought up the fact that she couldn't say no to, you know, opportunities out there. And it wasn't about sin, it was just she has a problem saying no and i and i said no one of the things you really 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 have to learn is to be able to say no uh, listra says you're muted are you muted can you hear, hear me? me i hear you yes can you hear me no it was and i wrote the note that, to ask if we were all muted i was because i was hearing um other background stuff so i was just making sure we were all muted while you were talking oh, okay. okay okay thanks so, so okay. let's go on and uh here's what uh we know we encounter lots of chatter about the end times and this is what the the main message about for the thessalonians was about the end times something that we probably all are interested in somewhat but they were getting some real misinformation. Anyway, Paul warned the church at Thessalonica to observe and stay focused on what they knew to be true. And that's the same as the tomato plant, the fig tree, uh, and so many other things. Focus on what you know to be true. Those are great analogies, great examples, but that's what we want. Paul wants to show us. You know, when we, when we looked at uh, lesson eight, focused on 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. It referred to the day of the Lord. And that's really what Paul is talking about here. He, uh, Paul wants the, uh, we're going to look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12, okay? Uh, and they often refer to, Paul often refers to the day of the Lord in these verses. Uh, how many of you are interested in what that day of the Lord is? Yeah, me too. Yeah, and I know Mike is. So, you know, the day of the Lord, uh, it's an interesting thing. I have two or three books out there on uh, the end times and how to interpret the end times. And I read all the Left Behind series, which gave me a, a lot of good insight, but really almost too much information uh, for this subject. But at the same time, it did put a lot of meat on the bones of uh, what we what we know. But Paul didn't necessarily give his readers new information. But what he did was clarify the truth. And that's what we need today. And I believe that's why the, the letter to the Thessalonians was written in his part of the Bible. I'll tell you something interesting that I found out. Uh, the letters in the Bible, if they are written to a particular group, then their title is that group, like Thessalonians, Colossians, Ephesians, and so on. If they are not written to a particular group, but we know who the writer was, then they are titled by the title of the writer. So that would be Paul, Peter, Mark, or not Peter, yeah, John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and so on. Uh, and if they have a particular subject, then it would just have been the subject like Revelation and so on. I just learned that this week, so <laughs> anyway, I'm just passing it on. Uh, this, the Thessalonians, uh, he was trying to help them reject the message proclaimed by false teachers, okay? They were intent on upsetting the congregation and encouraged the church, Paul encouraged the church to live in light of the promises of God uh, that God had made to them. Listen, I often share 
how do what encourages us usually to come to faith in Jesus and and accept him how do we how do we get to put a little bit of trust in the fact that we can accept Jesus as our savior For me, my, my what was in, of interest of me is what was the truth that that you know um, everything else was secondary to that really you know what was it, um, that's what's what, truth truth and how did you get it where did you see it uh, the Lord just tells it I just you know Lord opened up my eyes and then and, and then um, like you know I played what you know I wasn't on some search a lot, there's a lot of people who are some spiritual quest. I really wasn't. I was not. I was in sin, and um, and um, I just was really in the dark. I mean, so lost, like really. And um, it's funny because I was, I knew, and I was in my early, in my twenties, and I knew like if I, there's got to be, there, there's got to be more to life than this. I, to me, neither, no, nothing made, nothing seemed true in terms of Judaism didn't seem true. Christianity didn't seem true. I couldn't see the truth. I couldn't, I, that was just something the Lord put in me. I, I didn't know what was true, but I knew that I, I just didn't, you know, I didn't know. So I wasn't against anybody or anything, you know, I wasn't like that either. It wasn't like some hard, you know, hardcore liberal. I just didn't know. And oh. And the oh. Lord literally showed up, like literally showed up. And, um, you know, somebody was talking, you, know, you know, I was in sin with somebody who was talking with me about, you know, about things of, you know, the Lord. And I played the what if game. And there was one scripture that I somehow, somehow knew. And I don't know if that person told it to me that only through the son can you know the father. And I'm like, well, what? And then, then the, and then um, I, the person had me read the book of John. And and the book of John's, I I completely understood the book of John, you know, uh, and my and my it answered as to you know what's you know why be you know what is it about Judy you know being a Jew, you know what you know like it answered what that was about my that and what my purpose was was to know him to serve him, you mm -hmm. know so the scriptures gave me truth and and that point you know sin was not you know I. The issue of sin was not the issue for me. It was what was true. And then I could deal with the issue of, of my sin. You know, I just want, you know, so I want to know about the truth of God, you know, truth of life. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's true. So. But, you know, you read the scriptures. And to me, what I, what I think is that all of what you said, I, I can relate to. You know, I, I was totally, totally lost. When, and I was 40 years old. You were 20. I was 40. Uh, you know, I had a lot of other stuff in my brain and in these tapes, whatever was left in my brain at that time. But uh, I'll just tell you, 40 years old, I, there was a lot of stuff in there. But the guy came and he shared a little bit with me. I was in a car lot. I, many of you know the story. But then he opened the Bible and he brought in the third person. When he brings in the third person and now it's in writing, then if God is drawing you, you have that inclination. Of, okay, maybe these words are it. And that's what I believe Paul is kind of telling the church they had did not have the new testament yet they only had the old testament and the people in thessalonica they didn't even have the old testament necessarily they were got they were gentiles and they worshiped pagan gods so they were pagan and uh so now he's bringing this new gospel new new thing but he he's bringing the letters that were being written in the churches were becoming scripture even at that time yeah. uh, as as you know the letters were written and those letters were what the people could learn to rely on uh, because they were backed up by the lives of both the apostles and people who were writing them. And, and they could see what you saw and I saw and everybody in this room saw the change that took place in our life from the inside out. And all of a sudden, we started to understand, no, God is real. And if God is real, I can rely more on his word as being the backup for everything. I want to filter, if I can, them as much as possible through his word. I mean, that's why we're here today on Sunday. Uh, I love what we do on Sundays. But uh, Paul is going to continue to point the Thessalonians uh, to what believers know to be true. And I say what we know to be true, no question, 
is in black and white in the scriptures. Go ahead, Mona. Yeah, so I was just thinking, I never thought about this before. So then how much harder it was for the early believers after Yeshua to believe? Because it was just all based on what it's kind of like either the Lord gave him a rubber, right? The Lord would have had to give him some sort of a revelation based on what people are saying, but they didn't have anything. We had we have the word to look to to confirm what people are talking about. They well, didn't have that, right? So they didn't that, so how much harder for them to believe than for us? I have a great story that relates to that issue. When we were in Thailand, we were in Italy for 10 years, then we went to Thailand. A few years into us being in Thailand, and all we were doing was street evangelism, bringing the churches that were very small, fledgling believers out into the streets and giving them a chance to witness and live for God, okay? So a young girl in the church comes to faith, okay? As a result, she marries her boyfriend. She, I think, is a maybe 17, I don't even know, very young, but she comes to faith. Prior to that, her conversion she's a 100 percent buddhist living in a rural village so she comes to faith and they get married they have a child one night she falls asleep on the child it oh, suffocates yeah, yeah. and dies the people in the village told her they all put the blame on this newfound religion and the rejection of buddhism she kept her faith to this very day she loves Jesus. She trusts Jesus. She's had new children, and she is alive and praising God today. So it tells me that this power that God brings into our lives in the Christian, in the Christian faith that we have is bigger than circumstances. Uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't even want to go into the story about the rabbi, but uh, we better move on. But anyway. It just tells me and all of us, this is no small thing. When God comes into our life, he's not leaving. So we may have a lot of reason for him to leave or for us to reject him. But he loves us. You know, one thing that overwhelms me recently in the last couple of weeks, God has no real self-seeking motive to love us so much. He doesn't want us a part of some religion. He doesn't have a religion. He doesn't have one. He's God. And he brings us into his family and it supersedes everything else. But he gives us this word that we can rely on and fills us with the Holy Spirit to be there when we don't have the Bible open. Guide us through these days. And often, I believe, just like the angels that were in front of the donkey, we're going to have things in our path that are going to slow us down. Something's going to guide us to not go here, not say this, not be this. And when we listen, we're going to feel the blessing that is either to us or that we might be to somebody else. Does that make sense? Okay. Would somebody read um, 2 Thessalonians? Oh, okay. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 5. And look for... Uh, instructions that Paul is giving these readers. He's giving them some instructions here. And man, you want to, Mona, I'll go back to one more thing. You want to talk about fledglings. These are Thessalonians in an area of Turkey and Greece that has no knowledge of God other than Caesar, maybe, or uh, some other pagan thing. And all of a sudden now they're, they're being attacked by uh, uh, misinformation from religious leaders usually coming from Jerusalem to try to get them to break away from the hold of Jesus. And so nothing's changed. Wait, hold on before you go on. And, and nothing's changed, right? We see, we're seeing that all over the place. All over. I have a quick question for you, Chuck. So, you know, you, you, were, you had said something a moment ago, you know, when, when, you know, when, you know, when God comes into our life and even, you know, from my, my own experience, when come, you know, when God comes into our life, he never leaves. So I'm pondering, and, I, and you know, think about this a lot, you know, you know, especially with what we're talking about. So with, with all the stuff we're seeing, you know, and there's people that seem spirit, you know, people that say they are believers, but they're, they seem as dead and, you know, as dead spiritually as can be. So does that, I'm wondering if, you know, 
God really did come in. Are they really, you know, are they really, you know, are they really believers? They, there's people that can, you know, talk kind of like talk and talk and show up, but, you know, but they're as spiritually dead as all, you know, as all get out. What God tells me or seems to make clear to me in those situations, which we, I face constantly because my I'm a 24 seven trying to bring the gospel and bring people that have the gospel to be able to live it and know God better and so on. But as a result, I'll tell you, my opinion is this. It's up to God to make those big decisions. That's his job, not my job. But the other thing is, it's also my job to encourage them in the faith about what it really is about. Most people who have come to faith um, are somewhere on this step of faith. Let's say it's a ladder, and they might be on the first rung, the second rung, who knows, right? They're on this rung, but but they're they're not on the third or fourth rung where I might be. And there's 50 rungs, you know. I mean, there's all these rungs going. On. So what I say is, we encourage one another. Consider ways to spur each other on to love and good deeds. Most of the time, as far as God and I am concerned, whatever faith it took for them to accept Christ as their Savior is enough that they are going to get into heaven. That. God makes very clear. We are to be confident that we have heaven as our ultimate home. We have peace with God because of Christ. And we're just um, finite human beings who screw up here and there often. But God, <laughs> God isn't, you know, when I was a kid, I grew up in religious instruction. They had a one by one stick. It was about four feet long. When you screwed up, they whacked you with the stick. And I saw that as God. That ain't God. When we screw up, God is there like this with open arms. Because we're infants compared to him. And James says, if you break one sin, you broke all the rules. So, okay, over here, this guy is living wrong, or this person is living wrong. My job, go in there and try to encourage them. Hey, walking with God is not a joke. You know, I don't know how you would share it. But to me, what we're going to look at today He's telling these Thessalonians, hey, listen, this is not just one teaching here, one teaching here. There's one correct teaching. Don't be easily deceived because what I brought up before, what I wanted to say when, when you, I asked you that question, when we came to faith, we came to faith because God said that he so loved the world that whosoever put their faith in Jesus was going to have everlasting life. And we said, okay, not everybody, but I'm just saying, that verse has brought millions of people to faith. That verse tells us, I didn't come to faith because I'm good, because I read the Bible, go to church, or anything else. And if that's how I came to faith, that is what's going to keep me. Because it can't be by me. If it was me, I'm not getting into heaven. But it ain't me. I'm that's getting into sure. heaven. We have a Savior. And, and the word Savior and, and what he stands for is really what a, a lot of what Paul is talking about here to the Galatians and to the Colossians and so many of the other letters to try to secure them. And listen, we're children of God. We're not just children of some religion or some group. No, you're children of God. Uh, so let's look at one through five, if you would, in chapter two of Second Thessalonians. And Second who has Thessalonians. It? Chapter two, Second Thessalonians, one through five. Second Thessalonians. I got it right here if you can hear me. Go ahead, Mike. Therefore, I exhort first, first of all, that all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and, and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, and I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher to the Gentiles in faith and truth. 
Are you in Second Thessalonians two? <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> was, it's on the same page, but it's a different book. Sorry. Right. Listen, I'll just tell but you that this. was the scripture you read. I mean, sorry, that was first <laughs> Timothy. Yeah. With no mistake. Yeah, once again, that was right, we need to hear it for a reason, sir. I believe it's for a reason. All right, let me let me back up one page. I am sorry. <laughs> Five one, I'm sorry. But concerning the times and the seasons, am I in the right place? No. Are you in now second Thessalonians two? Oh, okay, okay. Two one. Oh geez. two one through five. Okay. I'm gonna try this again. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the great apostasy, the falling away, comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you that I told you these things? Okay, now, is that it? Mm -hmm. I'd like One, you to two, go five. back. I'd like you to go back a page to 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10. Mm -hmm. right. Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. Mm -hmm. Since it is a righteous thing with God, to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us from when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in okay. flaming fire, taking vengeance on those okay. who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop there, but I have a feeling of reading. Uh, was that- Am I, in the wrong place? <laughs> Am I in the wrong place again? No, no right. Second Thessalonians. I think you were right. I, right. I was in the no, right place. So, <laughs> so let's go on. This is uh, Paul. Is just finished sharing how God would care for His people when Jesus returned to Earth. We we read it in what you just read. He's going to care for His people. Now he turned his attention to some specific truths about that event. This way, this was necessary because opponents were creating problems in Thessalonica, sharing misinformation about the second coming. So here's what I'm wondering. Do you see anything discouraging you about God waiting so long or the second coming or whatever, or even if God exists in your life or in the world today? Does the world... world does the world want to condone uh, you to condone uh, the way the world is and the life of uh, sin and so on? Yes. yes. And how would that happen? What do you mean? Well, I mean, it's kind of like, I don't know. It's, that's just, that's the, just the message everywhere. You know, that's kind of like, that's the overall message, um, you, you know, uh, is that, you, you know, I can do whatever I want to do, and you have to agree with it. And you're, you know, you're a this, that, and the other. If you don't, you know, we get labeled by all, you know, all kinds of labels for not agreeing with the, with, yeah. you know, with what the world wants to do. Sure, and that that's exactly it. So uh, th those are 
some of the tactics that these false teachers use to try to uh, stir us up, you know, upset believers. But how, here's the big question going back to Thessalonians. How does the promise of Christ's return help relieve the stress of living in this very fallen world we find ourselves in? How does this, the promise of Christ's return, help us? Because we know we'll be at peace. Yeah. That there will be, that there, it's kind of like there, there uh, I think, you know, I think, well, inherently in the way that God built us is that even, you know, even unbelievers, everybody wants justice, right? We want people to, you know, pay people to pay for what, they, you know, what they've done against us or just in the world. And so that is the day of justice. Yeah, someday. Someday. Or the, time, or the times, you know, there will be, there are, you know, there will be a time. At the thing that we, one other thing we have to realize, even when things seem out of control, God is in control. Oh, it's very true. And we often find it difficult because where are you, God? But you know what? We know where he is he lives in us he lives through us he guides our words thoughts actions and he wants to give us peace that don't worry guys i haven't left my job i'm still in control so let's read second thessalonians chapter two six through eight and listen for the sequence of events that happen in this passage six through eight second thessalonians two and now you know what is restraining, <clears throat> that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, the coming of the lawless one, is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Okay, so let's stop there. Um, the, the book wants us to imagine that we are members of the church at Thessalonica, to whom Paul is writing, and to uh, name any specific details or basic truths about Christ's coming based on what we just heard. What are some basic truths? Well, you keep saying again that, in fact, this will occur. This is going to happen. You okay. can be sure I will return. That's for sure. I That's will right. not leave you as orphans. That's right. And what else is going to happen to kind of assure us? Judgment. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And Satan will be restrained, right? Yeah. The law was, will be revealed and then restrained. Uh-huh. But I think we'll, we'll get to see, so, you know, in terms of, you know, Satan will be revealed, we'll get to see what that looks like. Like, we, we know the name, right? We know that, that you know, there's a, there is a, a what do you call a I don't know, for lack of a better, I, I can't think of the term, a, uh, not an entity or a person, but you get, but we'll actually get to see what it looks like versus just knowing that it exists. Um, does it tell us anything about the lawless one's return and the necessity of it? And then, and it says, well, then the Lord's going to uh, kill it. 
what shows he what he has been being restrained all these years, and he'll finally be um, loosed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul explained that the lawless one would perform false signs and wonders in an effort to deceive people mm -hmm. who reject Jesus. That's what he's going to do. He's going to have signs and wonders to convince people to reject Jesus. Um, the lawless one could be on the planet. We don't know that. I mean, we just don't know. But there's definitely, is there much happening that are trying to deceive people to reject Jesus? Yes. It's everywhere. Uh, it's just everywhere. I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I read... Uh, I don't have news on my TV, only the local news, but on my internet, I get box news and that's pretty much where I go. But the stories make you cry. Yes. They make you cry. I mean, three girls beat up an old lady on a bus saying we hate white people. I, I, I'm not saying that anything except, where do they get this from? Somebody is just deceiving them, you know? And it's so prevalent, uh, you know, I mean, you know, here we are in a world that's saying, oh, we want to cause unity and we want to cause, uh, you know, uh, constant uh, acceptance of one another. And at the same time, somebody's out there teaching people to reject one another. I mean, it's just so obvious that, that it's really happened. Anyways, let's go down and read verses 9 through 12. Just 9 through 12. This is the end of what we have for today's reading, but I'd like to read it. All right, that is the one who's coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders and, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the, the love of the truth so as to be saved. How far am I going? All the way to 12. So, Two more. And for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false in order that they will that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness okay uh, so uh, that kind of <laughs> that gives a, a very difficult or tough answer to what you brought up mona about people that are kind of living uh, lives yeah. that are you know That's having true. trying to have one hand on one place and one hand on another uh, you know, it's not, you can't straddle the phone. Listen to Apple Music. Sorry. You'll need to accept the latest privacy agreement. Sorry. I, who, who was talking there? Huh? That was Siri talking. I pressed something on my iPad by accident. <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so it makes me wonder. And, and sometimes I think that we as believers, you know, we see people, that, they're just, I don't know. I don't know. I think we we relate to in, and we see this. I want to say in politics, you know, we we excuse the behavior or, of our political leaders, and for, you know, and the evil that they're doing, and you know, um, you know, as well, and you know, it's even in the body as and we're relating to them like they're believers. You know, you know, I, I'm not the judge, but it makes. But the scriptures all say that, you know, um, <laughs> you know, real, and to me, the scriptures say who they are, really, you know. Well, it should instill into us a, um, a very sincere desire to know God's will, because these guys who were trying to deceive the Thessalonians, they wrote letters with Paul's name signed to the letters. Mm -hmm. To the church. Oh. So they really, yeah, this if we reread these verses, you'll see that that's what they did. They went so far as to doing yeah. everything they could to try to authenticate the lies that they were bringing to these believers. Uh, and that's why it was so important for Paul both to write this to us today. And, you know, uh, listen, they just, they just, uh, I'll just bring up one thing, and I, if it pertains, I don't know. It wasn't something I prepared. But the Supreme Court just made a decision that um, abortion had to be looked at by the states and wasn't just going to be approved by the federal government. I don't know all of the writings, and I don't know all the ramifications, except for this. I know that all the news 
seem to focus on what did you see as the overwhelming idea that the, the news projected that people uh, saw in the decision? What people, what was represented was women are being, yeah, their rights are taken away. Yeah, and it's, okay, that's, it, that's one mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Their rights were taken away. And then they went on also to say they, that the uh, Supreme Court were a bunch of what? Murderers. No. They were called idiots by, by people in the highest government places there are in Washington. Yeah, yeah there was it's another... There was another term too. I heard I was listening to something too. I can't remember what it said, but um, yeah, like just yeah, yeah. Name the name calling of this, but it was some other name, you know, yeah. name, they, you know, yeah. They even went to their houses. They picketed them. They threatened them, and they did all these things. But Thank nobody, you. nobody brought up the babies. It's right. never been mentioned in the news. There's 1.5 million babies killed every year. They can't all be just. Go ahead, Diane. Yeah. It just the one thing that I am still waiting to hear for from some political voice is why they don't push it, birth control. If yeah. people can't control their emotions, they need to have they need to be able to, to take control of, of using birth control. It's free. Yeah. And, yeah. and yet you never hear anybody say, yeah. use that instead of abortion. You don't have to right. kill the child. Well, take, yeah. take the subject and apply what we're learning and studying today. And what it tells us is this, who is conveying <laughs> the news? Who in America yeah. conveys the news? Liberals. The news media. We yeah, listen, to yeah, news media. listen, I want to tell you, the guy that owns Fox News is a total abortionist. Not that abortion is the end of the world. It's a very, very heinous sin to me, but it's not the end of the world. But I know this, the guy that owns Fox News, he's pro-abortion. The guy that owns every single other news media in the country is pro-abortion. Every single one. There's not one that isn't. And they also, because of their position and wealth and so on, control the money that's given to a lot of the people for re-election. So whose voice are you gonna hear? And it tells us what the Thessalonians heard. Here comes the big wigs from Israel, from Jerusalem, and they come in with letters from Paul and they start preaching that it's not just Jesus. You know, you have to be circumcised and you have to do this and you have to do that. And, and when Paul comes back and he says, no, wait, here's, what is the message? Jesus plus what? Zero. 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 Right. Zero, guys. It's Jesus plus zero. He's our savior. And I think that's really the message of today, to be observant. Watch what's out there. Watch what's trying to get into your life and my life. And, and be observant uh, to try to live a life. Um, what would we want, number one, out of our lives? What would be a good number one goal uh, that we would want our life to to do attract Excellent. others to want to know the lord to... That's right. as a result would you be pleasing god yes oh for sure yes i'm telling you you know you look at this bible peter says it often but we know it jesus is in every single book because he's the savior of the world and what it tells us is not just that jesus is in every single book but salvation for mankind is a crucial crucial a uh, part of God's being with regards to mankind. He wants us saved. That's what he wants. And he wants us then as a result of salvation to have the ability to live a godly life. Sure, it will bring glory to God and carry out his purpose. But really, in bringing glory to God and carrying out his purpose, we're going to touch other lives in a way that's beneficial to them. We don't want to lie. We don't want to cheat. We don't want to steal. We don't want to deceive. We, those things may happen, but we don't want them. To me, repentance is we want to go God's way. We're not able always, but we want to, you know? So anybody have anything else they would like to bring up? That's, really good. That's a very important verse. The one, I, one comes to my mind a lot when I speak to people, that God is not willing. It's not his will that 
anyone should perish, that's but right. that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah. I would say that's what we need to be about, is that's conveying right. the knowledge of the truth. That's God's Definitely. will. Definitely. You know, uh, I hear it often, you know, share the gospel, and if you have to use words, but I say, share the gospel, and if you have to use good works. <laughs> the words are important. And I'll, I'll tell you one thing that happened to me this week that told me that. Um, yesterday, I did a meeting at Banyan. I've been doing them there for about four years. And the meeting was the Bible study on second, uh, on, on a, I'm sorry, on Ephesians chapter two. So uh, that was my Bible study. And I had already done it prior, in the, earlier in the week at another recovery center. And in that other recovery center, it was overwhelmingly a blessing to everyone. And I walked away just blessed immensely. But when I did this one at Banyan in Pompano, I walked away thinking, gosh, did anybody get anything out of that? And then I was reminded of what Paul said. He said, I don't come to you with words of eloquence or words of wisdom because it will take away from the power of the Holy Spirit. And Mona, what you said about you coming to faith and my own testimony and many others tells us, no, it was the Holy Spirit. He may have used the word of God, but that Holy Spirit definitely came in and opened my heart and mind uh, and so many others uh, to be able to accept Christ. Uh, I'm going to turn the recording off, but uh, I would like to pray before we go and uh, hear from you guys. We've gathered to worship here in the house of the risen sun.